Hi everyone, Internet PCS Book Reader here. Today I want to talk about Forever Barbie, the unauthorized biography of a real doll by MG Lord. As with as it is Mike Sound, for people who are not chronically online, Barbie the doll is perhaps one of the most historically politically charged children toys since its earliest iteration. Take for example Barbie's first best friend, Mitz. She first appeared in 1963 before she was discontinued in 1967 because of lack of sales. She came out again in 1987 for a while, then discontinued again until 2002 when she was pregnant off-screen with a ring already attached to her for some weird reason. Her pregnancy, yes, I'm still talking about the doll, caused a stir where people legitimately goes on protest because in her initial release, she was pregnant without any sign of her partner. So people got mad thinking that this will promote either pregnancy before marriage or worse, single motherhood, where a woman can raise a child by herself. Now in 2024, when the Barbie movie has found its success under Greta Gerwig's direction, receiving billions of dollars from people who loves it, people who likes it, and people who really really hates it for some weird reason. On the other hand, the movie's success also gave Mattel, the company that produced the Barbie doll, so much money. Both from the revenue of the movie, and also from the soaring sale of the doll that increased due to the movie also working as Mattel's most successful advertising of the Barbie's brand, at least in recent years. Before the movie, Barbie sale has been in steady decline every year since 2009, with a loss of 20% total sales just from between 2012 and 2014. Mattel's income got worse after Hasbro got the right to make Disney Princess doll because that right used to be monopolized by Mattel. Then it got worse again when in 2015, Mattel released Hello Barbie product, an interactive doll that listened and recorded to every sound near them, including the sound their parents might make if the doll are near them, those recording was also automatically sent to Toy Talk that doesn't have a secure server. And it's not like Mattel didn't try their best to avoid these losses. In 2001, when Brad Dolls camps out, it was the first time Barbie got a competition that sells more than their Barbie. To prevent this, Mattel sued MGA, the company that produced Brad's, falsely claiming that MGA stole their design because Brad's creator used to work for Mattel. This was when patent holder was held by the company instead of the creator of the design. And it works! Mattel killed the press doll and despite their effort, it never made a return that can compete against Barbie. And now with the movie, Barbie's brand has made a return in sales number with many brand deals with clothing, ice cream, and even car and many more. The movie itself is a very entertaining fiction, but when it comes to the history of both Mattel and the Barbie doll, it's very hit and miss with more misses than hits. And despite the success of the movie, the story of how the doll was produced itself hasn't changed much despite what Mattel was trying to tell in the movie. What the book is trying to do is to look at the history surrounding the doll from the 50 to now or as now as when the book was printed in 1994. Barbie herself is based on Billy Lilthol, a sleazy comic character from German newspaper Bill Zeitung, whose main character in the comic was a prostitute we should laugh at by going, woman am I right? <laughs> and because Barbie's doll doesn't come out with a body slider from Street Fighter character creation, a lot of Barbie's form resulted in the change of body image through the history of feminism. In 1968, the first feminists loved the idea of a single working woman because the doll at the time fit those images with the doll wearing working suit even before it was normal for a woman to get an office job. Then in 1971, during the second feminist movement, the most outdated of all feminist movement, this was before body autonomy and freedom of sexuality was an option, so that era of feminism doesn't accept the body type and clothing that Barbie have. Everything needs to be non-sensual or it's unacceptable. That's why Bobby Body's type was seen solely in a negative lens during this period. But this was mostly fixed in the 1990s when the third wave feminism came and with it body autonomy and the right to pleasure. This is when more than one stake on Barbie shape started appearing. Then in 2012, with the coming of the fourth wave feminism with the understanding of body positivity, came the right to have different kinds of body type that that the doll become more than just a doll at least for a while. Unfortunately, body neutrality only came long after that. But what all these changes had in common was how much it affected Barbie's product because with each change, Barbie also needs to change. Some of these changes were such a big deal that it was featured in one of Time magazine cover. Part of the reason why Barbie as a doll become somewhat of a female icon herself, it's because she was invented and made by woman for most of her life. During the 50s, Ruth Handler was the co-founder of Mattel when Barbie was created, and although the design of Barbie was credited to Mattel engineer named Jack Ryan, he only held the patent for the waist and knee joint in later version of Barbie. The original Barbie was mostly designed by Charlotte Johnson, who Ruth Handler herself recruited to work in Tokyo to design Barbie's look, and it was an instant hit. 
But being a fifth they showed new dream and aspiration for Kirsten and for had one before by changing outfit, Barbie can go from singer to an astronaut. Meanwhile, Ken was made solely to the consumer's demand. Back in 1961, a woman without any man accompanying her was seen as a failure to society. So even if they didn't put any effort into making Ken, they produced a few of him just to silence the room. And just like how Sackler family was responsible for how drug was marketed at the very least in America, Mattel and Barbie was responsible for direct marketing that are aimed specifically to children. Back in 1955, Mark Toys Company was the biggest toy manufacturer. They are so big that the owner, Louis Mark, was featured on the cover of Time magazine in December at that time. Still in the same year, Disney created the Mickey Mouse Club. Yes, the same show that will eventually cast the young Ryan Gosling and Britney Spears. At that time, no toy company has ever advertised their product through TV, but Disney's network NBC approached Mattel and offered them the opportunity. Mattel took the chance and after their first advertisement selling Bergen, advertising to children changed forever. Mark's toys that didn't keep up with the change will eventually go from being the biggest toy company to bankruptcy. And while some weird cringy whip might insist on saying, no, these are not toys from Japan, these are action figures. Barbie Small was first made in Tokyo, where their workers will mostly go away when August came when rice harvesting time arrived. Mata was also helped by Ernest Teacher, a psychologist that pioneered marketing using psychology. He's the guy who at the very least popularized trying to fill the void inside someone by buying products. A problem that's unfortunately only gotten worse today, especially because a lot of grifters are trying to sell lonely and confused people to give them their time and money. Mattel also tried to sell dolls other than Barbie like Mitch that I've mentioned at the beginning of the video, but none of them ever stick. Then other toy company make a copycat of Barbie to also capitalize on the success of the doll. Tammy, Tracy, the little chap family, etc. was made, but none of them really found any success. The only competitor back then in the 60s that had some success is Mark and Ghost Miss 17, a doll that screamed what if plastic got plastic surgery. But that success is because Mark got Lily's copyright and then sued Barbie. Mattel and Mark throw accusation at each other for a while with no winner, but no one in their right mind would want to buy Miss 17 anyway because it looks worse than knockoff Barbie. Even then, Barbie's sale was declining. Previously, Barbie was sold by selling dreams to the female demographic, but those dreams started to crumble in the 60s after a series of political strife in America. JFK was shot in the middle of the street. After years of non-violence reformation by the black community, the FBI killed Martin Luther King. Allegedly, of course. And also, after the publishment of Female Mistake by Betty Friedan, protests against pageantry also started to show which also hints at protests against Barbie herself. American is changing and with it the American dream that was used to sell Barbie, so Barbie needed to change too. Meanwhile, during all of this, the author's own experience with both Barbie and the development of her own body is different than most people. Her mother is Barbie herself, an athletic woman with great social skill, pretty with a great body. You might think that the author will grow jealous of the body type that Barbie and her mother share, but her mother then got breast cancer in the 60s, a far deadlier sickness than it is now. So Barbie's body type on her young mind was associated with the sickness and what is at the time shame that comes with it. It's an amazing book that is both historical to the world and personal to the author, with a lot of in-depth research into Mattel and how history has shaped the company and with it also the Barbie franchise. But there are some parts that I think the author is reaching too far to connect, part with witchcraft and mythology symbolism because I don't think people like Mattel think that far and if there's any similarities to those symbols, I think it's just coincidence. Especially when the book started comparing Barbie to ancient fertility icon, because really old fertility icon can have very different shape because body standards at that time are vastly different than the era where Barbie started and even now. Then there's also a part of the book that looked too deeply into the Barbie game in a way that barely connects since I don't think the developer was even paid enough by Mattel to care that deeply into coding the game. And just like the movie, it's a shame that there's no mention at all at Mattel business practice on how to produce their doll, which involves very dubious factory worker treatment that is mostly women. In fact, when it comes to the portrayal of Mattel as the corporate, the book is almost non-critical at all in depicting the responsibilities they avoided to become an ethical company. I don't know which because the author is such a huge fan of the brand or the people who works there who used to be at the top of Mattel that she interviewed for the book or what, but this lack of insight into the more bad aspect of Mattel business model makes some part of the book seems like it's trying to restore Mattel's image. The more the book ignores this issue and kept talking about theory behind what Barbie sexuality and nudity means, yes I'm still talking about the plastic toy, 
the more icky the book feels because you cannot make a comment about classism from Barbie's price point, his many DLC, and her choices of plastic friends, but then ignores the real life problem that the factory workers have. But other than those issues I have with the book, this is an enjoyable and somehow educational book that goes through Barbie's life, I guess. I give this a 2.75. What do you think? Let me know if I miss anything, so leave your thoughts in the comment below and subscribe to the channel. That's about it.